Um, if you brought your Bibles, get them out, uh, turn them on if they're electronic, uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, we're going to be good Bereans today. We're going to examine uh, the Word of God together. So I'm a bit of a history nut, so I'm going to dork out a little bit for you guys, actually a lot during today's uh, message, because I get to talk about the history of the Apostle Paul and the history of Emperor uh, Nero, who their time kind of overlapped a little bit in the city of Rome. So in the seventh decade, so in the 70s, uh, not 1970s, the actual 0070s, um, and these two famous men, they lived in the same city. Nero's name was, was making headlines, and Paul's wasn't. Uh, if Oprah had lived during this time, she would have wanted to interview Nero. Sean Hannity would have wanted Nero on his show. Uh, Nero would have been invited to state dinners hosted by the president. Uh, Nero would have been referred to as a hero. But Paul would have been a zero. He would have been a zero. He was stoop-shouldered. He was balding, no offense. Uh, he was, had a crooked nose. He was a cloudy-eyed old man. And Paul kept talking about this person, Jesus. Everywhere he went, he was talking about how Jesus was God. And eventually, Paul got locked up in prison. Uh, and if you asked anyone in Rome in the, the seventh decade, who will make the greatest impact on the world, Nero or Paul, everyone would have picked the emperor Nero. Some fun facts about him. Uh, his wife was named Sabina. Nero's wife was named Sabina. She was a blonde, head-turning beauty, and I, I don't know why historians know this or why they include it in their histories, but she took baths in donkey's milk. Uh, and in fact, the emperor kept 400 donkeys on site just for her bathing uh, things And not only that, when she was out of the bath, she got dried with fe swan feathers, and they used crocodile mucus to soften her skin. I don't recommend that treatment today. We have over-the-counter stuff that works great. Um, but what Nero wanted, I guess Nero got. And at the age of 25, Nero deified himself. He erected a 120-foot statue of himself, and people looked up to him, but they looked down on Paul. Paul was common. Uh, he was bow-legged. He was a small man. He was described as having a big nose and scruffy. And then he had thick eyebrows that met in the middle, so he was... He had a unibrow, I guess, um, which explains some things. But, uh, and his body was covered in scars from all of the, the torture and, and stuff that he went through uh, in this thing called life. And what we see is we see that Paul faithfully follows God's plan to the end. He wrote words of encouragement and challenges along the way. And you and I should do the same. So what I'm saying is Paul finished well. He finished well. And so my hope and prayer today as we, we look at the life of Paul, um, we start to see how maybe we can imitate Paul in some ways that we can finish uh, the race well. So the New Testament records the dynamic life and deep struggles of Paul. Uh, he, he had a pretty tumultuous life. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. Are they... Servants of Christ. I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Whew. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Remember, not Colorado stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray and I do not burn with anger? Would you like to live that life? 
Absolutely not. If we had to choose, we would probably choose the comfort of 21st century America, right? Paul surrendered his life to Jesus Christ when he had a personal encounter with the risen Lord. And Paul knew what that life was going to entail because prior to meeting Jesus, he was the one persecuting people. He was the one stoning people. He was the one dragging them off to prison. So Paul knew once he put his faith in Christ and became a follower of Jesus and followed the way, he knew what awaited him because he was the one that did it. And he chose to follow Jesus. Paul walked in major cities of the known Roman world, Corinth, Ephesus, Thessalonica, Galatia, Colossus, Jerusalem, Cyprus, Crete, Malta, Athens, Syracuse, Rome. He walked all over the place. And he was what we call a tent maker. He, he worked in the mornings, and then he spoke about Jesus and the gospel from 11 in the morning to about 4 in the afternoon every day except the Sabbath, and then he would go back to work. He also wrote books as he traveled and as he sat in prison. And that's where we get the, uh, the large portion of the New Testament is because Paul wrote letters to friends, to family, to churches, to encourage them and challenge them. How many of you get real mail? Anybody write letters back and forth with people? Yeah? 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 Nah, sometimes we're all texting and emailing and, and reaching out on social media. I would challenge you this week, write a letter. Think about someone that's been, had a big impact in your life and write them a letter and don't tell them it's coming. So when they get that email from the post office, they're like, who in the world is sending? Because even now we get emails, right, to tell us what's in our mailbox. <laughs> and then we can decide, as Kent says, if we even want to go outside and check our mail anyway. Real mail is fun. But in the letters, in, the, in, in what we have from the Apostle Paul, we see that Paul was both a prophet and a pastor. And he never got over the fact that the, the, the living Jesus met him, changed him, and commissioned him as an apostle. He never got over that Damascus Road experience. And here's just one example of him serving as a prophet. In Galatians 3.1, could you imagine writing a letter that starts this way? Oh, foolish Galatians. You get emails from me every week, and I don't ever start them with, Oh, foolish Freedom Church. Maybe I should someday, right? <laughs> Maybe this week will be the week. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. They had seen Jesus. Paul had told them about Jesus. Paul had explained what Jesus had done. And they had turned their back and started to walk away. And he says, don't be foolish. I don't know who's cast a spell on you, but Jesus was real to you. And then he acted as a pastor in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. This was a church that he wrote to that he deeply loved. And he's saying, guys, don't worry. Pray. He would go on or, or would say earlier in the letter in Philippians 3, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we're eagerly awaiting for Him to return as our Savior. I say it often, I'm going to say it again, that one of my primary responsibilities as the pastor of Freedom Church is to remind you who you are in Christ. You have been set free from sin. You have been set free from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin. And when you die, you're going to be free from the very presence of sin. You are free in Christ. You are deeply loved in Christ. When the world or your family makes you feel utterly worthless, guess what? You are in Christ. When this culture, when this society, when this government, don't even get me started, when it lays a heavy burden on you, when it comes after you, when it, when it encourages people to live counter to the word of God, we need to realize we are in Christ. We are citizens of heaven. Our primary citizenship is in heaven. You notice anything missing from up here? We don't have the flags. One of our dear friends went through a battle a few months ago at his church over the presence 
of flags. He moved it two feet to make room for something. And he had three families leave the church. No flags, because our citizenship is in heaven. And that means that when our government does something that, dis that goes against the word of God, eh, we'll pray against it, we'll vote against it, but our citizenship and our hope comes from upstairs. Amen? Amen. All right. In Ephesians, another letter that Paul wrote to, to, to the church in Ephesus, and that letter was meant to be spread around and read at multiple churches, he says this, and you can just hear Paul, the, the pastor, and, and his care and his love just dripping. It says this, May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Oh, I could, yeah, all right. He also says, turn with me to, to Romans. Romans is one of my favorite books. It's one of the... the the greatest writings in the Western world. In, in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 35, it says this, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? You ever wondered that? If, if what I'm doing right now, if what I've done in the past, is that going to keep me from the love of God? I think that. Like there's no way God could love me. There's no way. But Paul here asks this question, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? And then he doesn't wait. He goes on. He says, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or are destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we're killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Do you see that? Not just victory, overwhelming victory. Out of this world, victory. Verse 38, and, I'm in con and I am convinced nothing can ever separate us from God's love. You hear that? Nothing you do, nothing you've done can separate you from the love of God. He loves you. He loves you. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, nothing can separate you from God's love. So not only was Paul a prophet and a pastor, he was also a spokesman for God's grace. He was a messenger of grace. His favorite word was grace. He, was the, he called himself the chief of sinner. He was the master of Old Testament law, but he said he was still lost without Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, he says this, God saved you by his grace. grace. You didn't save yourself. Pastor Scott didn't save you. Andrew didn't save you. Kent didn't save you. Joshua didn't save you. God saved you by what? His grace. Not God saved you by your hard work. God saved you by your spiritual checklist. But God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. We do good works because we are God's masterpiece, because He has saved us, because He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, and we respond out of obedience and love, and we work. There's a little fly up here that's going to die sometime today. In Romans chapter 3, Paul also says this, Yet God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sins. Grace, 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 grace. Paul was a prophet. He was a pastor. He was a spokesman for God. And everywhere Paul went, he caused an uproar. In Acts 21, it says this, the whole city was rocked by these accusations, and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple, and immediately the gates were closed behind him. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. 
Paul's testimony to the truth about Jesus Christ and the grace that he offers put him on people's hit lists. Paul also revealed the secret of his ability in the face of opposition to endure to the end. He was rejected. He was often left for dead. In fact, one of the times he got stoned, he actually had to crawl back into the city and everybody was like, I can't believe he's still alive. Uh, but here he is. He, he faced severe challenges in his life. So how did he survive? How did he survive the beatings, the calamities, the challenges, the struggles, the betrayals, the aban abandonment, one after the other? And for us, when we look at Paul's life, it's easier as, easy for us to say, you know, I'm not being persecuted. I'm not being stoned. I'm not being thrown in jail. I'm not being whipped, right? So for some of us at Freedom Church, whether in this room or worshiping online, this isn't an academic exercise because we're facing obstacles and challenges in our life. They may not be as big as Paul's, but some of us, we, we're going through some heavy stuff in our life, right? We're feeling abandoned by family, by friends. We're feeling like there's a lot of relational tension. There's a lot of angst in the world. Some of us have been rejected by our families for following Jesus. Some of our friends think we're crazy for believing in Jesus. And maybe you aren't under the threat of imprisonment, but you're under the threat of rejection or isolation. We all are going through some storms, marital, relational, financial, personal, but, and Christ's followers face these challenges not alone, but with Jesus. And we see that while Paul was in Roman prison, he wrote to Timothy, revealing the secret of his endurance. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Timothy had traveled with Paul, and he became a pastor, and so Paul wrote him encouraging notes and letters. And he says this, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Always remember, not sometimes, not when you feel like it, not when things are going good, but always remember that Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preach. And because I preach this good news, I'm suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be chained. So I'm willing to endure anything that it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God had chosen. This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. And then verse 14, remind everyone about these things and command them in God's presence to stop fighting over words. Such arguments are useless and they can ruin those who hear them. Paul anchored his life to a hope that is out of this world. As we've been going through the story, this is what we call the upper story. Paul got glimpses into God's upper story, God's purposes and plans for mankind, God's overarching history from the beginning to the end. And Paul anchored his hope in there that no matter what was going on in our lower story, no matter what's happening in our day-to-day -day life, Paul knew that God existed before time, outside of time, and throughout all of eternity. And God's plan, even when we don't understand it, God's plan is perfect. So Paul entrusted his life into the hands of God. And that's why in Philippians 1, Paul can make this statement. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. As long as Paul had breath in his lungs, he was going to live for Christ. Yet he looked for the day when he would die and go home to be with the Lord. That's an attitude that you and I should have. Paul ended his life well, and Nero did not. I want to read you some famous last words from some famous people. Anybody know? And I'm going to date myself here. I pulled some stuff from the 80s, so please forgive me. Drummer Buddy Rich. You guys know who that is? Buddy Rich. He died after surgery in 1987, and as he was being prepped for surgery, a nurse asked him, is there anything you can't take? Meaning, 
are you allergic to anything, right? <laughs> and his last words, he said this, yeah, country music. <laughs> Richard Feynman, he was a physicist, an author, a musician, a professor, a traveler. He died in Los Angeles in 1988. And his last words as he was dying was, this dying is boring. Thomas Grasso, he was a convicted murderer. He used his last words to complain about his last meal. He said, I did not get my SpaghettiOs. I got spaghetti and I want the press to know. Winston Churchill, his last words were, I'm bored with it all. And Joseph Addison, who was a writer, he said this, see in what peace a Christian can die. See in what peace a Christian can die. Paul wrote several letters from Rome when he, was, when he knew that he was going to die. And his letters dripped with concern, with his love for people, with his desire for the gospel to be taken to the ends of the, of the world. At the end of his life, the emperor Nero, he was 29 years old. He was lonely. He was paranoid. His second wife had killed his first wife. And then later, his second wife was pregnant, and Nero kicked her, and she died. And four years after Paul's death, Nero committed suicide. Nero was no hero, but Paul still impacts us to this day. So some questions for you is, are you fighting the good fight? See, we're all fighting in this life, but is it good? Are we fighting on our knees in prayer? Are we fighting with the words of God? Are we fighting for souls? Are we fighting for justice? Are we fighting for what matters eternally? So that at the end of our life, when we're greeted by Christ, we can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. In that passage I read at the beginning of our worship gathering, Paul said that his life had been poured out as a drink offering to the Lord. Are you pouring your life out? as a drink offering to God. I want us to first of all see that we should learn from Paul's example. In 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, or chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. If God can use the murderer of Christians like Paul, he can use you. So what is worth living for? What is worth dying for? And the answer to that question is, Jesus. Be willing to give your whole life for the mission of God. The second thing we should learn from Paul's life is that discipleship matters. We didn't go in depth into Paul's relationship with Timothy, but it is key to understanding how we got here today. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 1. It says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. In 2 Timothy 2.2, there's four generations. There's Paul, who taught Timothy, who was to teach and entrust the gospel to faithful men who would teach others. We must be in a discipling relationship with other people. This doesn't mean that we sit around and we read books, although that's a large, that's a portion of it. This means that we're doing life together with people. You see, Paul could write this to Timothy and call him his dear son because he had walked with Paul through many of these trials and tribulations. Discipleship is the only way to protect the church from going astray. It protects believers from deceivers. It builds up the church. It grounds new believers in the faith. It fosters maturity and developing saints, and that results in more disciples. Discipleship is to be deliberate, determined, doctrinally sound, and aimed at duplication. We want to be a church that makes disciples, that makes disciples, that makes disciples, that makes disciples. 
We have some unique opportunities here at the church to be in these discipling relationships. We've got the men's Bible study on Wednesday. I have discipleship pods that meet uh, throughout the week. We have a Sunday night uh, Bible study for adults where you can come and get training and encouragement in the word. And those are just the formal ways. There's nothing stopping you guys from getting together throughout the week to encourage one another, to love one another, to challenge one another. And if you're like, I don't know how to do that, come see me. I'll give you some materials to look at and to study. It's fun. Finally, it's going to sound a little weird, but it's okay to be ordinary. It is. It's okay to be ordinary. There's no St. Nero cathedrals. People don't name their sons Nero. Lots of people are named Paul and Pauline. And the real difference makers in the world are not those that seek the spotlight, that seek attention, that are seeking celebrity. It's the ordinary Pauls and Paulines. It's the church who are making a difference for all of eternity. The ordinary Sunday school teachers, stay-at-home mothers, fathers, nurses, electricians, retired folks who are laboring away in anonymity, doing your thing for the glory of God. If you're loving your kids well, if you're showing up at work, if you're hanging in there with that grumpy spouse, if you're taking it a day at a time, it's okay to be ordinary. Life comes with challenges. Life comes with storms. And don't underestimate how God is going to use your life and the life of somebody else. Don't be disheartened. Most of us look awfully ordinary. Amen? Amen. And the church, with all of her bumps and bruises, looks terribly ordinary. But when the church begins to sing, it's beautiful. You guys have all heard the name Billy Graham, right? Do you know the name of the person that led Billy Graham to Christ? Nope. Does the name Dorothy Dickinson mean anything to you guys? Or John Bonk? Those are two people that were instrumental in me coming to know the Lord. We have, in our faith family, we have missionaries to India and Nepal, Ted and Judy Olson. The amount of people that are going to be in the receiving line for you guys when you get to heaven, I can't even fathom that. It's okay to be ordinary. As long as you're being ordinary for God. Amen?